This week on the Back Table Podcast. So now what I do with the sausage thing is I can put uh, an end snare down. It's like the little triple loop end snare. And you twist it like like you're doing spaghetti, like yeah. a little mixer. And it, it like the teratola. I mean, it's like putting a yeah. teratola in. So you twist it up and then you try and pull the end snare into your cat. And if it just comes in, you know, you don't have anything. Yeah. And so you, you twist, 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 twist until you try to pull it and it gets caught. Uh-huh. And as soon as and it's caught, you, it. you, you know, you've got a big string. And so you just keep suction on and you keep your, your end snare hanging out and you pull it through. And then it, it, some, you know, often that's the leading edge. So it'll pull the whole thing out and it's, you get like an anari uh, <laughs> in the pulmonary type of fact. You get a big thing <laughs> that's coming cool. out. That's cool. That's a great idea. I've never heard of that. So I can, discovered it by accident after, you know, just flailing for an hour on some clock. <laughs> you discovered it on accident. <laughs> Welcome to the Back Table Podcast, your source for all things endovascular or otherwise minimally invasive. You can find all previous episodes of the podcast on iTunes, Spotify, or backtable.com. Subscribe to the podcast, leave us a review, or reach out to us on Twitter or email to let us know how we can make this a more valuable resource for the endovascular community. With over 500,000 patients treated globally, Impact Admiral Drug Coated Balloon is the market leading DCB for treatment of femoral popliteal disease. Learn more about how Impact Admiral DCB can affect reintervention rates for patients with PAD by visiting medtronic.com slash five year DCB. Market declines, unemployment, the COVID-19 pandemic. Don't let headlines derail your long-term financial strategy. This Backtable episode is brought to you by Yafi Tedessa, Edward Jones Financial Advisor in Dallas, Texas. He'll work for you to help you understand the impact of short-term events and how to prepare for the long-term. Learn how he can help you reach your financial goals. Visit edwardjones.com slash Yafi Tedessa or a little bit easier to remember is backtable.com slash 401k for more information. Edward Jones, member SIPC. Mike, do you have a financial advisor? Nope. Why not? I don't know, man. You know, I've been trying my best to do it on my own. But no, I mean, it's an important question. I started my current job and uh, they, you know, they didn't have a 401k that started for my first year. Was like, so I wanted to, to meet my contributions for that year and I didn't know how. So I didn't. Yeah. How long do you think you're going to do it on your own for? <laughs> I don't know. Uh, I just had my third kid, Aaron. And uh, <laughs> well, there you, know, you go. All this, yeah. all this free time that I thought I had, which is already very slim, uh, is gone. So I, I am reaching the point where I want to make sure that I'm checking all my boxes and that I'm not, I'm not getting behind on any of this stuff. Yeah. Well, if you if you want to, I would tune in to this uh, webinar that Yafi is going to do on uh, retirement plans and tax savings. And uh, the easiest way to to sign up for it is to go to backtable.com slash 401k. The information will be on the website or on that page. So go ahead and sign up. Okay, I'll do it. All right. This is Michael Barraza, your host for today's episode, recording in Baton Rouge, Louisiana. Today, we're talking about dealing with arterial thrombus and thrombotic occlusions in the leg, and I'm honored to welcome Dr. Don Garbett to help walk us through this. Don is an interventional radiologist and presumably all-around great guy in Eugene, Oregon. Don, thanks for sharing your time and expertise with the Backtable community. Hey, thanks for having me. Super excited to, to talk with you guys. What time is it in Oregon? It is, uh, it's almost nap time for my kid, but it's 11. Perfect. Uh, about one o'clock here, which gives us about a 50% chance of finishing this podcast in time for the Super Bowl for the 530 Ooh. kickoff. Uh, yeah. So, you know, strap in for a good four hour episode. <laughs> um, so, uh, Don, why don't we start with just having you tell me about your practice? You know, just give me the basics. Yeah. So uh, I'm part of a private practice group. We're about 20 radiologists, five interventionalists. We, we operate at two hospitals and then we have our own outpatient clinic. You know, our, our uh, practice is pretty varied. We do, our, we do PAD, venous work, um, all the standard IR stuff, you know, NAF tubes and whatever. A lot of oncology and some, two of my partners do stroke um, as part of a multidisciplinary stroke yeah. team. Um, and we're, we're really, you know, we're, we're a full group of diagnostic and everything, but we mostly, we mostly do IR. So I'll do one diagnostic day, maybe two diagnostic days a month. Nice. Which is kind of like a break. My wife's like, are you on diagnostic today? <laughs> <laughs> Can we go to dinner? 
Uh, but yeah, it's, I feel like it's pretty high level IR for the most part, you know, complex cases, um, it's, it's, it's a satisfying practice. Uh, I think, you know, the PAD piece where a lot of practices aren't doing that much, but you know, it varies around, but we're doing quite a bit. We have, um, we get referrals from primary care and, uh, you know, kind of varied around, but we also get referrals from our vascular surgeons and right it's, on. it's interesting because they're mostly they're mostly, they do mostly open surgery, honestly. Yeah. Um, and then they each have like a day in the lab and, you know, I think they have to choose what they want to do. So they'll just do like three diagnostics and, and get out. And then anything, <laughs> anything else gets basically sent to us. That's awesome. So we get the, we get community referral and we get referral from vascular surgery too. Yeah. That's pretty cool, Don. Uh, is there anybody else doing endovascular PAD work besides your group in the hospital? I mean, and aside for the diagnostic ones that the vascular surgeons are doing, like cardiologists, anybody else? Um, so, yeah. Yeah, that's a good point. We have one. There's um, how many? It's probably like eight cardiologists. Uh, one of them does PAD and he has like one PAD day a week. So he's in the lab doing PAD as well. Um, and he'll do three cases. And he'll do more complex, like he'll do an atherectomy and, uh, you know, some complex stuff, but he won't do a CTO. And then, you know, we operate at another hospital. It's kind of like our smaller hospital. And there's a vascular surgeon over there who's a little younger and does all endo, almost all endo, and does not share. <laughs> <laughs> so, and he doesn't share with any other vascular surgeons. He doesn't share with any, he doesn't share with his partners. So the community is a little varied. <laughs> Yeah, it, it's remarkable how much, uh, you know, the saying, you know, all politics is local, how much it applies to PAD. You know, I'm in my oh, yeah. my second job, but, you know, in my, my first job, I worked at like eight different hospitals and it was different at every one. Oof. And, you know, you also get like a lot of variability in, in terms of uh, how much people are willing to collaborate and how not, as you know, you're already seeing in, in the two hospitals you're covering. Yeah. Um, did I make up that you guys have a vein clinic as well? No, we do. Yeah. So that's our outpatient clinic and we do, yeah, we'll do, you know, saphenous vein work and all the complex yeah. stuff and that feeds into our deep vein practice too. So we yeah. do. But the PAD stuff, recon. you're doing that at the hospital. Currently. Yeah. Okay. We, we, we do have some exciting things. We're, we're opening an outpatient lab, which I'm pretty excited about. Nice. That's great. Yeah. I can't wait. Yeah, I'm, I'm jealous. <laughs> um, but, uh, you know, moving on to, to what we came here to talk about, you know, thrombotic occlusions of mm -hmm. the lower extremity arteries. I mean, that's obvious, you know, it's important for obvious clinical reasons, but, uh, you know, in my opinion, it, it can also be vital for any vascular specialist, like from a practice building standpoint, um, you know, in, in my experience dealing with like acutely cold legs, it can be kind of a, a gatekeeper of sorts for elective PAD work. I mean, if, you know, I've heard colleagues mm -hmm. use it to justify losing PAD to, cardiologists and vascular surgeons, you know, will say, you know, well, we don't have to take the cold leg consult anymore. Don't get called in for that at night. And, you know, then on the other end of it, the, uh, you know, other people are using that as a tool to keep people out saying, well, if you're not doing the cold legs, why should we give you the, you know, the chronic PAD patients? Um, I don't know. I mean, I, I think that's pretty important in, in my own experience. It was very important. I actually use that as, uh, like a tool to, to kind of keep, break into PAD at a hospital where we weren't already doing it. Um, you know, I gave my cell phone to the, uh, the ER docs, the intensivists and the hospitalists at one hospital and just said, look, call me for these. Or, you know, if I saw, mm -hmm. uh, an acute occlusion on imaging, I just call them myself and, you know, was able to use that to kind of get them to send me either inpatients and then these patients would follow up in clinic and, you know, was able to build some chronic stuff from there. Um, I don't know. I mean, are, are you the only ones that are doing it at your hospital? As far as the work, yeah. So that the, what you brought up, I think, is interesting because um, were there vascular surgeons where you were, or were you like basically the only? Yeah. Oh, there were. Okay. There's everybody: vascular surgeons, cardiologists, uh, and interventional radiologists. But there were only a couple of us in interventional radiology who had done a good bit of PAD and wanted to continue that. Yeah. So you know, it's interesting at our place. So anything that comes in through the ER. Um, for arteries is going to get vascular surgery consult, right? Mm -hmm. So that we're not going to get the call, the first call on arteries. We're we're kind of we're first step on venous. They'll just you know no call to the vascular, but for arterial they call vascular surgery. And <clears throat> so what ends up happening? Uh, I don't know if this piece is interesting or you know I guess it all is. Yeah. So they'll call vascular and they'll you know do their assessment. Do they still have movement? Do they still have sensation? Um, you know, get the Doppler, feel for pulses. 
And then really they just, as soon as a Doppler comes, they just call us and say, Hey, uh, you got a 72 year old guy with acute pop thrombosis. Um, can you get him in today? <laughs> <laughs> that's the process. They're like, I'm starting him on heparin. Uh, and it, that's during the day. If it's after hours, you know, if it happens at 8 PM, uh, they'll just, they'll call us at home. Hey, just started a guy in heparin. Can you get him in for Angie tomorrow? Here's the story. Look, I think that's important, though. I mean, I think you bring up a good point. I mean, and that, in my experience, was, was how I was able to, to get those phone calls and get those patients is that, you know, I made an effort to try to be the, the person who's available first for an angio. Yeah. You know, if you can get it, you leave the first one to get that patient on the table, that's helpful to them. They just want to get those patients, like, out of their ER. Exactly. I think, you know, we have, for IR, we have, like, sort of leverage in our hospital because we have a lab all day. Yeah. And the vascular surgeons, they have an OR all day. Right. They don't have a lab. They have a lab one day a week and they don't, they're, they've already got outpatients booked for that day. So sure. they have no interest in taking that hospital patient to Angio. You know, they'll, they're happy to take them to the OR. Um, yeah. But they, they really but it don't is, want to it's take a bigger ordeal to go to the OR than it is to the Angio. Yeah, it At is. least where I am. It is. Oh yeah. Same. Yeah. Um, so it sounds like your ER though is, is pretty used to fielding these. They kind of know how to do the initial workup. Uh, I've seen a lot of variability in places I've gone, you know, uh, how much, you know, basically guidance you have to give them in terms of working these patients up. Uh, you know, when they call you, it seems like they've already gotten a Doppler at least. Is that correct? Yeah. I mean, you know, everybody gets Doppler out of the ER and yeah. then, and then heparin started in the ER. So at least they're not asking like, Hey, what do we do? <laughs> Yeah. So Start I'm, I'm print, we'll get to it. <laughs> That's not uncommon to get those phone calls. Um, what do we do? Cause you know, the, the one I would get a lot is, uh, do we need a CTA? Uh, and, sure. uh, and sometimes the answer is yes. I mean, are you getting that for oh, a yeah. lot of these? My answer is always yes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so what, you know, we, we, uh, I think one of the variabilities is, you know, I'm on call Monday night and then my buddy's on call Tuesday night and then we're alternating all week. Yeah. Um, so it comes out of the ER. Vascular surgeons don't care for CTAs unless there's like a triple A, right? Right. They have, they have no desire. There's just like a delay of care to them. So what I've typically done is they, you know, the surgeon calls me. They t they say, hey, can you get him in for an angio tomorrow? And I'll just jump on Epic and throw in an order for a CTA. Okay. So that I have something for tomorrow. But I'm yeah. going to switch that to MRA soon. You're going to what? I'm going to switch it to MRA. <laughs> I don't know. I don't, I don't know if we have the ability to do that here, at least well. Uh, uh, what else are you getting in the workup before you go in? Um, so I'll look back. You know, a lot of patients have prior angios. Yeah. Right. So <clears throat> basically just looking up the history. Have they thrombosed before? Um, the basics of the workup have usually been done. You know, are they, are they acute on chronic? Are they totally de novo history with a thrombosis? Um, was there an event? Do they have stents? You know, what, what's their, what's the roadmap? And the CTA, uh, like I said, uh, you know, like you said, I like to get that yeah. before we get to the lab. Right. Um, and then, you know, in terms of putting it all together and establishing the severity, I mean, do you usually rely on like, mm -hmm. Rutherford classification or just kind of just stalt? Um, yeah. You know, I love Rutherford because uh, it's just nice to put yeah. one word onto them, you know, right. Rutherford 4. Yeah. Rutherford five. Um, it, it doesn't, you know, so that uh, Rutherford is good for the acute on chronic guy or, yeah. you know, the acute on chronic patient, which most of them are. And so I would say, you know, half of a, half of the patients we see like this already have an ulcer. Right. And so most of them are fives. Most, yeah. most of them are going to be Rutherford five. So they're acute, probably chronic with an ulcer. Um, you know, it's, it's not common to have a six, you know, yeah. massive, uh, you know, sloughing tissue. They're right. usually kind of a little bit early, although early COVID, we saw a whole bunch of just black feet. Really? <laughs> yeah. People are just like, it's, it was fine. I was fine. You know, it was pretty bad, but it's, it's sort of tapered off to where it's mostly like toe ulcers, profound ischemia. Um, I'll probably tangent around the you know, we'll see an arterial thrombosis and no pulses. And then we'll get the Doppler and the, the tech will say, Hey, there's a DVT also. Really? Yeah. And see so if, you know, um, when I originally came here, I, I really had very little arterial experience mm -hmm. and I was a little bit scared. Like I need to learn this. So yeah. 
I just started grabbing, you know, JBS stuff and grabbing textbooks yeah. from vascular surgery and just reading, like, how do I assess the patient? You know, given I know vascular surgery, seeing them, but I got to know it too. I can't just be. Oh, clueless. absolutely. Uh, yeah, I'd, I'd, I'd started with a lot of experience in, uh, you know, chronic PAD, but I didn't have a lot of experience with, uh, you know, acute emboli, thromboemboli, cold legs. And so that was something I really had to learn early on. I agree. I, you know, I spent a lot of time reading uh, a lot about the, you know, the, the clinical assessment things. Like, I mean, some of it's straightforward, mm -hmm. but uh, that was something that I, I kind of picked up, picked up in my first couple of years. Um, so, you know, in most circumstances, it sounds like, you know, you, you have them, if you call it at night, you usually have them heparinize and then set them up for an angio in the morning. Are there any circumstances yeah. in which you, you know, feel like you, you need to go in and do it now? I'd say it's pretty rare. Yeah. It's pretty rare. Yeah. There, there are some, you know, you have a patient who has an EF of 25 and which is probably the source of their embolism, right? Uh -huh. They probably had an LV thrombus. Um, and those patients will be profoundly ischemic, super okay. painful. And so occasionally, you know, we'll take them at night, but not, not in the middle of the night, you know, right. like we'll get them at 8 PM, yeah. you know, maybe do a late angio. Um, but even then, you know, those patients are a little difficult, uh, cause yeah. you're doing sedation. They're maybe a little, have some delirium and I've, I've certainly made some bad choices <laughs> taking, you know, a delirious patient to the cath lab. It's a challenge because you don't want to give them anesthesia uh, yeah. if you can avoid it. But I've had a couple where it's like, we're going to have to use anesthesia. You know, I don't know how well yes. this guy's going to tolerate being on his back with sedation. And then it, there's really not a whole lot in what we do that's more frustrating than mm. trying to do an angiogram and then having the patient immediately move the legs. <laughs> like they wait on you to say, okay, on three, be still. You just wait for it. It's like, okay, on three, I'm going to <laughs> move my leg like crazy. Yeah. Uh, and it is just, uh, it, <laughs> yes. it is, it is so frustrating, but, uh, you know, I have traditionally done these with, with kind of light sedation. What are you usually doing? Uh, yeah, I say super light, you know, for, for the elderly folks, I go real yeah. light, you know, half a milligram of her said 25 mics of Fent. Wow. Case. That is That's the whole case. Yeah. That's awesome. No, I don't need, I just want it like pretend sedation. Totally. <laughs> Which I, there is a placebo effect. Like, oh, don't yeah. worry, we're going to sedate you. And we could throw, you know, I'll throw Benadryl. I'm like, they might have an allergy. Let's give them 50 I love Benadryl. Benadryl. <laughs> Benadryl's great. So I guess, you know, we'll jump into the procedure. Um, mm -hmm. But we'll, let's start with, you know, managing the anticoagulants. Uh, in the oh, heparin. Sure. You just continue the heparin? I don't stop it. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. They'll call me and say, when do you want to stop heparin? And I just, I just continue it. You know, we're you using bolster ultrasound. in the case? Like, what do you, what do you do during the case? Like, managing yeah. that so i'll get started you know uh get access get some initial angios and yeah. um you know depending on what the scenario is in my right. i may be shooting the aorta i maybe not be um and then i'll get an act right away just to see where we are if we haven't stopped heparin yeah you know essentially weight based so yeah. i'll do for my bolus uh 100 milligrams per kilogram okay do you have a target and i don't ACT? care if they get really yeah yeah, over three hundred. Okay. If they're if we're working on clot, because it's it's so easy to display stuff. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> um, and then uh, selecting access. How do you select your access based on location of the clot, expected treatment plan, assuming you know mm -hmm. no other chronic occlusions? So I'm I'm sort of uh, I, I would say uh, traditional, I guess. Um, mostly femoral access. Yeah. Um, but I'll I'll look at the Dopplers because. I don't want to be accessing, you know, some severely stenotic area. Uh, I want to be able to address uh, every issue along along my treatment tra tract. So, you know, if there's a severe left iliac stenosis, but we're treating a right leg, I don't want to do the procedure and then leave something that could be a problem at the end. Yeah, I'm with you. Um, um, and then mm -hmm. what about sheath size in terms of what device you think you're going to be using? So I'll, I'll start with a five just for yeah. a five French for, uh, just my diagnostics. And then I'm I think in general, um, I don't have any mental limits on sheath size, uh, except for one piece. If I'm in a lice overnight, yeah, I, I want to keep my sheath size small, but I'll, <laughs> I'll go up to, I'll generally go up to nine French overnight. Yeah. 
um, if I have to, yeah. and, you know, based on tool use. Right. But I don't want to be putting a 12 French in and then leaving that overnight. No. I will go to great lengths to not lice if I can. <laughs> yeah. Uh, it, overnight lysis is like the bane of my existence. I'm, I'm glad I don't do it as much anymore. Um, so, you know, I, I wasn't asked you like what all you need to image, but I think, you know, if you got a CTA, you, you know, pretty specifically what you need to look at when you're going in for the most part. Um, mm -hmm. You know, I mean, I, I guess, yeah, I don't, I don't, I can't think of any other scenarios. I mean, you know, do you usually do both legs if you're treating one leg? I mean, I guess if you have a good CTA runoff, you probably don't need to. But I mean, there's still days where I come in and all I have is a Doppler. That's true. Right? Yeah. So I'll, you know, and, and that's pretty much based off of when it came, you know, the patient came in at midnight, we got an urgent Doppler and we did, we started heparin and I'm just taking them to the lab in the morning. Yeah. Um, and so those ones, yeah, I'll, I'll do a full runoff. I'll, I'll put a catheter in the aorta, um, you know, shoot that and then shoot both leg runoff. Um, and that's probably half of what I do. I think yeah. half of the cases. So you answered my question for me. I was going to ask you, you know, with all the, the, uh, new thrombectomy and thrombolysis systems that we're seeing all the time, if you're still doing lysis, mm -hmm. uh, and if so roughly how frequently. Yeah, I, I think, and I've, I've struggled to answer this to myself to like, <laughs> you know, am I lysing this one? <laughs> <laughs> um, so I think some of it's just, you know, and I, I hate to say it, but like, how much work do I have to do today? Right. Um, are we starting this case at eight and I have two Y nineties right after this? Yeah. That, you know, the dose is kind of like decaying. Yeah. Um, so I think in that scenario, obviously what I'll try to do is just see if I can do them later in the day after all the outpatients are done. Yeah. So that I don't have to lice. But if I'm getting them in first thing in the morning and I have a bunch of cases, I'll, I'll throw a lysis catheter, you know, try to, you know, I'll have a really strong game plan. Like we're going to get in, I'm going to get through the obstruction. I'm going to drop a lysis catheter and I'm going to come back at three o'clock when I'm done with my other cases. Yeah. Um, but I, you know, it's, I think that's decreasing the, the number of lysis I do is certainly, yeah. it was, it was a hundred percent for some period right. of time. Exactly. Um, and, and it's then I, probably 50 or less now. Yeah. Even even now, like I, I still find myself, uh, I'll I'll go into it saying I don't think I'm gonna lice, and I still end up lysing. Uh, <laughs> yes, <Yeah. laughs> a lot of times when I'd, I'd plan not to. Um, yeah. So, but you know, uh, a question I have for you based on that is is when you do have you know say say it's Tuesday, you got a, you got a busy day, uh, and you know you got that patient. It's like all right, let's just get him in here. Let's let's cross it, mm -hmm. lice it, and then bring him back. How long are you waiting for those? You know, if if you have the opportunity to get that catheter in early. Uh, mm -hmm. which is not always feasible. I mean, you might find out about it at night or in the afternoon. If you get that thing in early, you know, when are you bringing it back? Uh, you know, if I, it depends when I got it in. If I, I don't, I don't think four hours is that, I don't, I don't know if four hours is adequate. So okay. if I get it in in the morning, I'll bring them back at the end of the day. So maybe four or five. Yeah. Okay. Um, and if you like to if have at least like in, eight hours or so, it sounds like. Yeah. Roughly. I don't know if that's some, based on any science. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. How, uh, how, how fast do you run on the TPA? Um, so we, we pretty much have standard, uh, we do, uh, either we'll start it at one, one, uh, one milligram an hour. And then after 12 hours, cut it back to half. If and, I'm doing more than one limb, I'll just do half each. And so are you using fiber engine levels and have them adjusted based on that or, or not? That's a good question. I know. Uh, we're still checking. <laughs> yeah. I'll say we'll, we're still we're checking. Here. And I get that 2 a.m. phone call of the fibrin engine is 110. Yeah. And I go, great, thanks. Yeah. We had this great, my last time, this great order set. It was so specific. And mm. it gave very detailed instructions of, of how to adjust based on the fibrin engine level. But they would still call me anyway. And I, yeah. I found myself occasionally, it's like they call me. It's like, eh, just forget what all that said. You know, just leave it alone. Uh, yeah. I don't know. I don't know the right answer. Um, at, at the 2 a.m. phone call, I'll say that's, I'll actually say that's great. Thank you. Is there any bleeding? Yeah. Okay. I don't need to know about any more levels tonight. Yeah. <laughs> right. <laughs> uh, and I'm sure you haven't had any issues based on that. Um, no. Yeah. Uh, you know, it seems like just the standard happen. leaky sheath. You know, the sheath, yeah. there's a lot of blood around the sheath. Right. I, and I just tell them that's, it's doing its job. Yeah. That, you know, that's, it's working. That, it shows it's working. <laughs> right. Um, all right, enough about lysis because I hate it. Yeah, uh, yeah. You know, uh, what else are you using in these, uh, you know, acute cold legs? Mm -hmm. 
so basic, you know, the basic tools now, I think, uh, the, the penumbra catheters. Um, so cat six, cat eight, uh, the RX, which is the four French one. And then I don't think I use cat three much anymore because the, the RX basically covers the same yeah. zone. And then I have not used, have I used the cat 12 in there? I don't, I haven't used the cat 12 in an artery yet. But you're using almost entirely the penumbra system for cold legs. Pretty much. That's, that's um, basically uh, all I've used um, for thrombectomy in mm -hmm. lower extremity arteries. And I've had, <laughs> I love them. I've put the, the flow retriever in the yeah. iliacs. Interesting. And that worked. That worked immensely well. <laughs> Did it really? How'd you close it? <laughs> I just pre-closed it with, with Man, uh, that's awesome. per close. Yeah. yeah, it was ridiculous. It just ran it in and the claw was gone. No way. One pass? <laughs> One pass. That's awesome, man. I, I may have to see those pictures. Uh, That's really cool. So so mainly Penumbra system. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I mean, it. it there, it's a good system. And I, 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 the first time I ever used it was on a case that I thought was, uh, was a, well, I thought it was mostly chronic, but, uh, mm. you know, uh, blow up an angioplasty balloon and then shoot the run after and just the, <laughs> the tibials are trash. I was like, oh my God. Uh, and so I called the penumbra rep and I was like, I need you mm. right now. Uh, and yes. fortunately he, he got over there really quickly, sucked it out. It's like beautiful result. I was like, okay, I, I like this thing. Um, okay. So mainly that system. Um, so what do you do when you, you know, you, you run your, your penumbra catheter and, uh, it doesn't, it looks just almost exactly the same after. Well, I think, you know, there's some nuance to that. So I'll shoot the angio and I keep discovering new things. Like every, okay. yeah, I feel like every time I do a case, I discover something new. Um, just because of the sheer volume of it, you know, we're doing yeah. like a few a week. Oh, wow. Yeah. So we, we you get to keep trying new things. <laughs> so, you know, sometimes you shoot the angio and you, you know, from the Doppler that it's clotted. And I think from the fistula world, we know, like, usually there's an underlying thing, right? There's a right. lesion in your chronic folks. There's a lead, there's a stenosis somewhere that was the leading edge of it. Maybe there's a dissection. Um, maybe the tibials went down and then took the whole thing, or maybe there's a pop aneurysm and you don't always know these things. Um, and so there's like, there's a look, right? And you know, from DVT, when you shoot the venogram, if you've got the, you know, central clot going all the way down. So that, that is somewhere in the mix. That's not acute. Right? We think of it as acute, but that's not acute. That's right. that came from somewhere, it came yeah. from somewhere else and it's formed. And so your wire will sail around. Um, but what I find is that the catheter, the cat eight might get it out. So you get your wire down, you send your cat eight down and you got your, maybe you're using your separator you're going to try without it, but nothing, not much is going to come out. You're just going to get little bits, right? Cause it's, it's like a little, it's a little uh, sausage. And so, and then that's one type of clot. And then you see other clots where it's like, maybe more like pudding. You see the contrast kind of mixing. Yeah. Um, you wonder if there's dissections in there. Yeah. Um, and that that thing comes out. Like you put the cat eight down. Yeah. And that starts breaking down and coming through, or maybe a little separator. But it's that tube. So the tube was a puzzle to me for a while, like the little sausage guy. <laughs> so now what I do with the sausage thing is I can put uh, an end snare down. It's like the little triple loop end snare. And you twist it like like you're doing spaghetti. Like yeah. a little mixer and it, it like the teratola. I mean, it's like putting a yeah. teratola in. So you twist it up and then you try and pull the end snare into your cat. And if it just comes in, you know, you don't have anything. Yeah. And so you, you twist, 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 twist until you try to pull it and it gets caught. Uh huh. And as soon as and it's caught, you, it. you, you know, you've got a big string. And so you just keep suction on and you keep your, your end snare hanging out and you pull it through. And then it, it some, you know, often, that's the leading edge. So it'll pull the whole thing out and it's, you get like an Inari, uh, <laughs> in the pulmonary type of fact, like you get a big thing <laughs> coming cool. out. That's a great idea. I've never heard of that. So again, discovered it by accident after, you know, just flailing for an hour on some clock. <laughs> you discovered it on accident. <laughs> um, I was like, what else? What else guys? Right. I, I'll go to my text. Like any ideas, ideas, guys. <laughs> that's awesome. That man. I mean, that's, <laughs> That's where these ideas come from. Is, mm -hmm. uh, 
disaster cases. Um, do you use, you know, you know, say it's just like a smaller embolus. I mean, are you using a filter wire or anything else for embolic protection? I mean, you're dealing with emboli, you know. <laughs> so, no, that's a good question. So I think I, I personally don't like them because they're a pain in my butt. Mm -hmm. uh, but I'll use them. I'll use them if if the tibials are clean. Okay. Right. So if the yeah. tibials are clean, I'll throw that down. And then the case takes twice as long. Right. And and I'm like, you know, magging up on the filter and I'm telling my tech, be careful. And it's like this long, tenuous process. And every time the stupid wire filter moves, I get annoyed. Yeah. Of course. Um, but it, it, I guess, you know, it takes longer, but it saves you in the end. Yeah. It saves you in the end. So, then you yeah. look at the basket. It's like, do I really want to know? Um, yeah. Yeah. Um, <laughs> So, and, and dealing, you know, say you get it out, everything looks good. And, and mm -hmm. as we see in many cases, there's an underlying stenosis. Uh, do mm -hmm. you treat it then when the patient's, you know, fully anticoagulated, has had clots, you know, et cetera, or do you bring it back? Um, so, yeah, I will treat the underlying issue uh, at the same session. And I think initially, when I first started, I was reluctant. I would wait. But I saw too many failures. Okay. You know, and we see that they come right back, right? So right. And when we see gonna... them back the next week. Yeah. Thrombosed. Yeah. And so even a minor dissection, like the old non-flow limiting dissection. That yeah. I think there was this period of time when we had DCBs mm -hmm. or early DCB experience, right? You know, everyone's like, oh, the non-flow limiting dissections, you just leave them. The DCB works. Yeah. And I found the opposite. The, the, <laughs> the, uh, the, the non-flow limiting dissections seem to be you know, that's the leading point. Yeah. I, I don't know if it flips over or what happens, but I don't so know. They all, don't, if there's a know, flap, I stent it. Or if it just looks worse under, you know, you got to wonder what it, what it looks like under Ivis. Like if it's actually worse and it looks angiographically. Um, yeah. What are you using yeah. for those? Um, kind of, I think I try to use Supera whenever possible, mm -hmm. if it's SFA or POP. Yeah. Um, but the, the, I like the, it's just personal preference. I like the Innova stent. Okay. Which is the same platform as Alluvia, just non-drug. Okay. And it's it's super flexible, like Supera. It's super easy to put in. It lands okay. like, you know, on a dime. Love it. Um, okay. I'm sure I'm, I'm forgetting some big things, but let, let's move on to talk about graphs. Uh, oh, yeah. You know, opening up a graft, uh, you know, I, I, yeah, I know. I, I agree. I hate um, the graphs. But... What what really guides your approach to revascularizing a graft? Uh, you know, I'm mean, thinking about the anatomy, the material, age. So yeah, and you've got your you you got your vein grafts, and you've got your repeat vein grafts, and you got your <laughs> cryo vein grafts, and you got your you know your uh, Gore-Tex grafts. Um, well, what's not, I mean, what's nice about the the synthetic graphs is at least you know it's like it's either a five or a six or a seven or something right so that's easy to pick your balloon size at least um in your synthetics you can be super i like it because i can be super rough in there yeah i could just ram a jam with the cat eight no wire just bouncing around smushing <laughs> not worried about side branches right um they can be clotted for a month <laughs> you can still get it open okay um we had one we had one maybe last month where I, I thought I had read that the graft had just occluded. And so I went in, I cleaned it out with a cat eight and mm -hmm. my end snare thing. And then uh, the vascular surgeon comes to me the next day and he's like, Hey, you know, that graft was down for like a year. Oh my God. <laughs> I, I was like, there's no way. There's no, no. way it was down for a year. That's They're amazing. Like, yes, I, it was down for a year. Yeah, that's incredible. <laughs> He was surviving off his profunder or something. And then he, man, I don't know. He was running marathons after you done. Yeah. Um, <laughs> man, we're usually accessing for a graph. I know it always is going to vary oh, yeah. based on where it is, but uh, you know, do you ever just do a direct stick of it? You know, like a fem fem. Yes. Yeah. yeah. So the fem fem, um, I find you know some often the ends of the graphs, right? You, you, they're just like rocks. Yeah. So I'll try from, you know, wherever it is. So if it's, yeah. if it's a, let's not say fem fem for now, let's say okay. fem pop. Yeah. I'll try from common and mm -hmm. or the up and over and yeah. try to get in, but often that's not feasible. Yeah. Um, and so I'll just, I'll take an 18 gauge needle, ultrasound guide a needle into somewhere in the proximal aspect of the graft. Yeah. 
and then send that wire back up, snare it through. And and now you've got at least you're starting uh you know, you've got something. Okay, going you snare your it track. through your your common femoral access. Yeah. Okay. To to at least get your tools going into yeah. it. Yeah. Okay. No, I know what you're talking about. Okay. Yeah. I mean, the, um, only, the danger on that is that you may get like a little lipstick effect on the top of some clot popping out and going into your profunda or something. Okay. Yeah. Which can be a pain. But you already taught us about how to remove those. So, you know, all is well. <laughs> Grab it. <laughs> yeah. Um, okay. Uh, what about underlying stenosis? I mean, you know, the anastomotic stenosis in the graft. Are you treating those? Um, yeah, I do. I'll, I'll use, um, I'll u- usually use a traditional regular balloon. You know, Mustang or whatever it is. Uh, and then I guess, you know, you do find that you need a cutting balloon for those things. Yeah. So how far across the lesion are you inflating it? As far I mean, as like, a, well, overlapping? you know, I'm just thinking about, you know, something with like an acute angle with it, it's, uh, you know, origin artery gotcha. or insertion, you know, I get kind of yeah, nervous. It's going if, like this. Exactly. Jackknife okay. effect. Yeah. Yeah. I, I mean, I'll just put a wire way through and okay. so that it's kind of, it kind of, okay. down. No issues with that. All right, cool. I guess that is a concern. Uh, you know, as long as there's not a huge size mismatch. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, you can always under... I mean, you can always undersize. You can go four millimeter and 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 hope that everything looks good. <laughs> is it? Does it work pretty well doing angioplasty of anastomotic stenosis like that? And you know, Is it durable? Long term? Hard to know. I mean, in my mind... I haven't done any of those. Yeah. I mean, they work in the short term. Yeah. But... I think, you know, in my mind, the, the fem pop that goes down is, is already destined for failure Yeah. in the next year or two. Sure. And so you're just kind of, you're getting them to their next solution, right? Yeah. You're keeping the leg alive. So no, I'm, we can I'm with something you. better. Yeah. Um, okay. Uh, really my last question is, uh, you know, dealing with unexpected intraprocedural clot in lower extremity arteries, you know, oh. uh, either, uh, you know, you're, uh, you're treating somebody with a, with a chronic lesion, a CTO, and then, you know, you see a little bit of clot developing distally or, uh, yeah. the one that I've seen, uh, you know, a handful of times is, is somebody that I think is, is mostly chronic. And then, uh, I'll send the Benson wire toward the lesion and it just passes, flies uh, right through. It's like, Oh no, no, no. Uh, yeah. what's your approach to those? <laughs> those are tough. So meaning the clot that just happened during your case, either or take one, either one. Okay. We'll do the other. So that that's where I feel like it doesn't matter what you, if it's super acute like that, like it happened during the case, it yeah. doesn't matter what you use. Yeah. You can use the cat. You can use uh energy jet. You can take the energy jet down. Um, don't have to worry about blood loss because nobody yeah. knows. Right. It's just, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's, just it's always hidden. 30. <laughs> yeah, exactly. 30 and yeah. blood loss. Yeah. Um, so yeah. And in the, in the hyper acutes. Okay. Energy jet cat whatever okay and it might be based on what sheath i have in yeah um it, the, the problem is if it's in the tibials in, in my mind and you know I'll, I'll just try and so my first piece will be okay let me take the rx the cat rx down into the mm-hmm. tibial and see if i can get it and if okay. that doesn't work i'm starting to swear and <laughs> I'm starting to oh, sweat a little bit. Yeah, exactly. Um, yeah. Trying to get a wire all the way down through it yeah. to like salvage. And, uh, you know, lysis is still in my mind of like, yeah. uh, we might need sure. to keep this patient overnight. But I'll try to resolve it with either the RX or um, maybe the angiojet. Uh, what's the other thing? Or just a balloon. Okay. So yeah. I find I often just try and balloon it. I'm like, oh, we're just going to turn it in toothpaste, smush it along the side. <laughs> it's going to be fine. Never works. Yeah. I always do it. Yeah. Um, occasionally the jet stream, uh, in a tibial. So that was going to be my question for, yeah, yeah, that, that one that you think is acute, but I mean, think is chronic and maybe acute on chronic, uh, when, if you're using that. So it does work. I would use it more, except every time, I don't know if you have this experience. I'm in a case and I'm like, all right guys, uh, jet stream. And everyone goes, oh, (laughs) (laughs) And they'll just wheel the penumbra vacuum into the room instead. And That's they're like, funny. you said penumbra, right? Yeah, we heard you say penumbra. We've already opened everything. <laughs> they're paying for it, so you gotta. <laughs> I don't know why the techs hate it so much. I don't know. Um, but it, it does, it will, it will clean out a clot in a tibial. Yeah. 
Um, but then what if, you know, in that, that other scenario, when you think it, you're dealing with a chronic occlusion and the wire just flies, um, what's your approach to those lesions? Say like yeah. a distal SFA. Yeah. Where you think it's a CTO. It's probably, so, I mean, I, I think most scenario. of those are acute on chronic or even yeah. subacute on chronic. Right. You know, I think I do go to the, I'm just trying to think of the last one I did that did that wire goes through. Okay. So I'll get them. I uh, recheck ACT. Okay. Obviously, um, making sure we're good on that. And then I will put a little bit of TPA into it. Okay. Right away. So I'll, I'll, you know, we keep like four in the room, four TPA yeah. in the room. I'll just say, give me the four TPA. That's a great idea. Um, make sure the keep ACT is okay. The um, and then I'll put a catheter right into that area and put a little TPA right into okay. it. Okay. Kind of treating it like a, you know, a fistula. Yeah. Thrombosis. Um, I, I don't have patience to let it sit. So I'll just go immediately. <laughs> I think my first thought is like, can I stent this? Can I just stent and get out? Am I going to displace clot? Yeah. And so I think for, and maybe I've just been lucky, but I will often just stent those and I get away with it. Yeah. You know, I don't send anything downstream, but it, maybe it's cause the TPA, maybe it's the heparin, um, and I honestly, I, you know, I saw my partner do that where I was like, here's a huge clot. You need to go aspirate. He just laid the stent. He's like, done. <laughs> <laughs> and I, you know, I see the, the European guys posting how they're dealing with these things. And I see they're using the, you know, the Asperex a lot. Uh, you know, they've got, that's kind of their main thing now. So I could see doing that. You know, you've got essentially an AngioJet with an atherectomy device on it. Yeah. I mean, it's a cool tool. And sure, it's all going to depend on the lesion, too. Yeah. Yeah. No. It does. And it, it's not always an easy decision, and sometimes yeah. it's just guesswork. And I, I've even had a couple like that where, you know, I thought I was going to be treating a, a chronic lesion, and I ended up lysing. And, uh, you know, <laughs> that, that, that's always the, the hardest thing to explain to the patient, you know, that they're going to be going home in, you know, a few hours. It's like, no, you're not. But Yeah. You do what you have to. I've had, you know, I've had the, my, dev my own devastating errors as well like i had a i had a lady this is an odd one i had a lady she just had bilateral severe claudication buttock claudication we knew she had at least one iliac occlusion and so i did the angio and found that she had now had bilateral iliac occlusion so i did like you know i did the radial access went and put a catheter at the bottom went mm -hmm. and recanalized the iliacs and my my left my left uh groin access I didn't know was high. Mm -hmm. So my left groin axis was high, well above the ligament. And it wouldn't have mattered except the, the left external iliac still had some stenosis. And I'm like, well, I yeah. can't leave a stenosis at the end. Right. So I balloon, balloon, balloon. And what I don't realize is that I'm ballooning right out of the arteriotomy. Mm -hmm. Right. Because my axis is high. And I go to, you know, shoot the final pictures. I'm like, victory, everything looks great. Shoot the pictures, just huge extrav coming out of the left. <laughs> so scary. And it's in the retroperitoneum. And I sort of had that moment of like, oh, God. Yeah. First, what's going on? Because I, right. I just, I still don't realize it's a high stick. And then how do I fix it? So immediately I'm like, call vascular surgery. Um, and I just get a balloon in, right? Mm -hmm. And... She's a, she's a lady with like a EF at 30. Right. Of course. And so now I've, I've lost who knows two or three liters of blood and finally get it, you know, can't cross, can't cross my access site. So I go down the common or down into the SFA access, get a vibe on across the access site. Mm -hmm. Um, so it's all fixed, but there's a lot of blood loss and now shoot or repeat. She has thrombos, both legs, both of them. Great. And we have too much blood loss already. So there's really right. like, I can't lice, I can't, I can't aspirate. And, you know, we took something good and kind of messed it up. Yeah. Way messed it up. So yeah, I, you know, vascular surgery is like, Hey, uh, all right. Looks like we should just do an open thrombectomy. And so yeah. they took her to the OR, M you know, mostly saved everything. But, uh, you know, it was just one of those learning pieces. Absolutely. You know, not a, not a, not the, um, where it came in with a clot, but where I caused it and I, something I couldn't fix right away. 
Yeah. And, and those are the ones that stick with you. And those are the lessons you learn best. You don't make that yeah. mistake again. Yeah. <laughs> Don, what else did I forget to cover that you think is important? You know, I guess some of the stuff is just the workup, you know, figuring out and, and you, you that's done simultaneously, right? They come in, sure. the Doppler, the CTA, um, do they, you know, we get an echo, right? Mm -hmm. Is it thrombotic? Um, the hypercoag workup, if the echo is negative, they may have factor five or they may have anti, uh, cardiolipin antibody yeah. or one of these, you know, antiphospholipid where they, they can throw arterial or whatever. I mean, and then, so those things happen immediately, but we don't know the answers to those until, you know, days later. Okay. Yeah. I think that's just the workup piece. Cause we, we want to know what to do with them after we've cleaned them out. Right. Of course. Um, and I think for the most part these days, you know, they'll be heparinized until everything's good. And then I think most of us go with Eloquist at this point. Okay. Um, seems like mostly good for all comers. Yeah. Um, and I've talked to nephrology folks about, you know, renal dysfunction. Like what if their EF is 15 or yeah. sorry, their GFR is 15 and they like Eloquist too. Yeah. So it just makes it easy. So, you know, for the ones who had, you know, acute events, uh, acutely cold lag, and, and they were more on the severe side, who all do you have involved with follow-up, mm -hmm. you know, just making sure, you know, evaluating limb salvage, uh, making sure yeah. they don't have, you know, compartment syndrome, anything like that? So they'll, they'll stay, they'll, yeah, they'll spend, most of them spend a week in the hospital. Okay. Right. For the full workup and recovery. Yeah. And, um, and so vascular surgery is involved on all of them. And, mm -hmm. you know, a lot of them need minor amputations. Yeah. You know, they need a toe or whatever. Absolutely. And so that usually happens during the hospitalization. Okay. Um, they'll be set up with wound care. Uh, you, if there's a, you know, if there's an ulcer or an amputation, they'll be plugged in. Um, and then we have them, you know, there's a debate about it, but we have them follow up with us. They're also following vascular surgery. Yeah. And so there's a little bit of, you know, we have a lot of PAs and they're like, vascular surgery is already seeing them. Should we be seeing them? too isn't that just like a waste of patient's time and i just tell them you know look we operated on the patient i don't i don't care who else is seeing the patient right i totally agree we, we operated so yeah. we have to see them there's thing you know the vascular surgeons are thinking about one thing and we're thinking about a totally different thing exactly uh and you know i mean these patients develop new stenoses they have contralateral stenoses and they're yeah uh there's a lot to there's <laughs> there's a lot to break down yeah. And it, you know, it's all about just want the patient to get the best out of what we can do for them. Right. Yeah. Like let's keep the legs as long as possible. Let's keep the feet as long as possible. And I think that everyone's got that same outlook, but I, I the vascular surgeons definitely approach it in a different way. It, it's all local, you know, it, it's, yeah. uh, what people are doing is going to differ no matter where you go. I saw so much variability between the eight hospitals that I worked that, uh, I think, all you can do is what you do. And I think, I think you have the right approach that, you know, you're seeing these patients regardless of who else is. Yeah. And, and you know, I, I think that's just the, that's like you said, that's the politics and you have to decide as a, as a, you know, I, I think we, we got to think of ourselves as surgeons really, or, you know, however you want to do it. Yeah. Um, once you touch that patient, now it's, it's your responsibility. You can't just say, Oh, they got it. Oh, you got it. Yeah. <laughs> the vascular surgeon because yeah. it's easy to do that it really they'll would be so it. easy to do it yeah yeah they'll keep it <laughs> yeah <laughs> all right i think that's about all i got don thank you for doing this we appreciate your time and expertise and and thank you for our listeners all right we'll catch you on the next one all right thanks man i got you out of here in time for the football game it was great several Perfect. hours to spare <laughs> <laughs>